Jesus is so surrounded by the crowds that he walks to the shore, steps into a boat, and drifts out a ways so that he can speak to the large crowd. He then started with the parable of the sower, as we looked at last week. During this sermon, he gave seven different parables, and among them was the parable of the wheat and the tares. So starting in verse 24, let's read. Jesus presented another parable to them, saying, The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while his men were sleeping, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went away. But when the wheat sprouted and bore grain, then the tares became evident also. The slaves of the landowner came and said to him, Sir, did you not sow good seeds in your field? How then does it have tares? And he said to them, An enemy has done this. The slave said to him, Do you want us then to go and gather them up? But he said, No, for while you are gathering up the tares, you may uproot the, uproot the wheat with them. Allow both to grow together until the harvest, and in the time of the harvest I will say to the reapers, First gather up the tares and bind them in bundles to burn them up, but gather the wheat into my barn. Let's skip down to verse 36. This is the tares explained. Then he left the crowds and went into the house, and the disciples came to him and said, Explain to us the parable of the tares of the field. And he said, The one who sows the good seed is the son of man, and the field is the world. And as for the good seed, these are the sons of the kingdom, and the tares are the sons of the evil one. And the enemy who sowed them is the devil, and the harvest is the end of the age, and the reapers are angels. So just as the tares are gathered up and burned with fire, so it shall be at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send forth his angels, and they will gather, they will gather out of his kingdom all stumbling blocks and those who commit lawlessness, and will throw them into the furnace of fire. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father. He who has ears, let him hear. So in this, or for many of you, 2020 has been a difficult season of life. We see everything that's happening in the world and it makes us angry. We aren't just angry because we're witnessing evil deeds, but we're angry because we are suffering as a result of those evil deeds. The consequences of sinful actions are hitting home. It's no longer what we only see on the news that we can just turn off the TV and go to bed peacefully. It's hitting close to home, and that brings me to my first point. First point is, the righteous do not suffer in vain. In this passage, we see that while the workers are sleeping, the evil one slips in and sows tares among the wheat. Notice that the sower is not the one sleeping. The great sower never sleeps, but his men do. When the men awake, they notice that there are now tares growing up along with the wheat. The reapers, that is the angels, notice and immediately ask the sower who has done this. The sower knows all and promptly tells them that the evil one has done this. The response of the angels is to request the immediate removal of the tares. Though it is easily in the power of the sower to, to permit the angels to remove them, he instead instructs the angels to leave the tares and let them grow amongst the weeds. Why? Because he doesn't want the wheat to be uprooted if the tares are to be removed. In Jesus' explanation of the meaning of this parable, he doesn't explain what is meant by the wheat being uprooted as a result of the tares being removed. One could speculate many things about this and come to various conclusions, but perhaps Jesus was intentionally vague about what the potential for uprooting means. But what we do know is that the sower is good and wise, and it is far better for the tares to remain than for even some of the wheat to be harmed. The emphasis here is the great care, love, and compassion that Jesus has for the sons of God. It's the kind of love that would not and cannot lose any from his grasp. It is the care of the great shepherd to seek out even one lost sheep. When Jesus suffered on the cross, he could have called 10,000 angels to save him, but he permitted the evil of the crucifixion because it was a necessary means for his resurrection and in turn salvation for all who would believe in him. Even in Jesus' high priestly prayer in John 17, he prays specifically that his followers not be taken from the world, but that we remain in it and not be led into temptation. Why is that? because our time here on earth has a purpose that far exceeds all the present sufferings. When we suffer in this life, that suffering is never meaning meaningless. 
the trials of this life, whether they be emotional, physical, psychological, or spiritual, they're all means in sanctifying us. If there was ever a man to complain about suffering, it was Paul. Paul, in his second letter to Corinthians, describes the many ordeals that he went through. He says, Beaten times without number, often in danger of death. Five times I received from the Jews 39 lashes. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. At night and a day I have spent in the deep. I have been on frequent journeys in dangers from rivers, dangers from robbers, dangers from my countrymen, dangers from the Gentiles, dangers in the city, dangers in the wilderness, dangers on the sea, dangers among false brethren. I have been in labor and hardship through many sleepless nights in hunger and thirst, often without food and cold and exposure. Apart from such external things, there is a daily pressure on me of concern for all the churches. Who is weak without me being weak? Who is led into sin without my intense concern? Notice that Paul speaks mostly of physical suffering, but there's also a psychological, spiritual, and emotional toll on him where he has concern for these upstart churches who will carry on the most important message this world will ever hear. How distressing it must have been to see these churches dealing with serious sins. And as we've been going through this series in Corinthians, as Tom's been bringing that, we see the many tr struggles that the Corinthian church was dealing with. A few verses later in that same passage, he speaks of the thorn in his flesh that he prayed to be taken away. As Paul is persistently imploring the Lord to get rid of these sufferings, Christ spoke to him these words, My grace is sufficient for you, for power is perfected in weakness. This is the key to understanding suffering. Power is perfected in weakness. God uses the weak things of this world to demonstrate his power. Therefore, consider this. When we suffer and continue to praise God, the power of God is most vi vividly displayed. Think of Job and his suffering. He declares, though you slay me, still I will trust in you. This statement alone cast down Satan's declaration that Job would only praise God because God had given Job many things. Think of Paul and Silas in prison. They were bound in chains for preaching the word, and instead of fearing for their lives, they stayed up all night bound in their fetters in a dark and dank prison, singing hymns and songs of praise to the Lord. Suffering is not meaningless, Power is perfected in suffering. So use your current trials, temptations, and sufferings to respond faithfully and display to the world the mighty power of God within you. The righteous do not suffer in vain. The next point to observe from this passage is point two. God will punish the wicked. The word of God has much to say about the wicked throughout all of scripture, and Jesus' teaching here is no exception and does not min mince words whatsoever. It has become fashionable in modern Christianity to sugarcoat the destiny of unrepentant sinners. As a result, the wicked live their lives in misery, leave a miserable legacy to those around them, and suffer for eternity. eternity. Though God knows all the wheat and the tares, we don't, so our call is to continue to sow seeds into a field of wheat and tares in hopes of saving some. The genius of parables and why they're so effective is that they demonstrate a spiritual, spiritual reality using physical examples. In this passage, the sower is the son of man, the enemy is the devil, the reapers are the angels, the wheat are the sons of God, and the tares are the evil one. A physical example is compared to a spiritual one in each of these cases. Yet in this parable, the destiny of the terrors and the wicked are the same in many ways, but different in one important way. They're the same because they are both destined to be consumed by fire, different because the terrors, after being consumed by fire, will turn to ash and it will be all over for them. But Jesus explains that the wicked will not just suffer for a time and then disintegrate into ashes, like some annihilationists will falsely proclaim today. Instead, they'll experience weeping and gnashing of teeth. Jesus says elsewhere in Matthew 3 that this fire is unquenchable. In Mark 9, Jesus describes hell as a place where a worm does not die, and again, he refers to the fire is not quenched. 
Jesus also declares that at the end of the age, the lawless and the stumbling blocks will be removed from his kingdom. This again reemphasized what I mentioned in the intro, that the kingdom of God has a broad view as being anywhere in his, everywhere his dominion is, and also a narrow, narrower view of those who are the sons of God. The lawless will be in the kingdom, but not partakers of the kingdom. In Revelation chapter 20, 11 through 15, we get a glimpse of the final destiny of those whose names are not written in the Lamb's book of life. After the millennial reign of Christ on earth, when Satan is bound, Satan will then be loose for a brief period of time. He will deceive the nations and then make war on the saints. As he surrounds the saints with what will appear to be almost certain victory for Satan, God will send fire from heaven to devour Satan. He will then cast Satan into hell for all eternity. Right after this, there will be a great white throne judgment. So let me read from Revelation 20, um, 11 through 15. It might be good for you to just turn to that because we'll be going back to um, that latter part of Revelation. So Revelation chapter 20. So starting with verse 11. Then I saw a great white throne and him who sat upon it, from whose presence earth and heaven fled away, and no place was found for them. And I saw the dead, the great and the small, standing before the throne, and books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged from the things which were written in the books according to their deeds. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and Hades gave up the dead which were in them, and they were judged, every one of them according to their deeds. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. And if anybody's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. When believers consider our present sufferings, injustice, injustices, and we see the foolishness of those who are perishing, it's easy to get wrapped up in vengeful thoughts. This reality of the destiny of unrepentant sinners should remind us that vengeance belongs to the Lord, and we are the ministers of mercy amongst both tares and future wheat. In Paul's first letter to the Corinthians, he observes that those who are perishing consider the message of the cross to be foolishness. Like a rich, sick man criticizing the poor, healthy man, so it is with non-believers of this world. They can see the blessedness of those who believe, and yet they will not believe because of the pride in their hearts. What a travesty for a non-believer to realize one day that the remedy for their situation was right in front of their nose, and it only required that they become like little children to obtain it. In Matthew 18.3, Jesus says, Truly I say to you, unless you are converted and become like children, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. Whoever then humbles himself as his child, he is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. The misery of the wicked is a sobering thought, but for those who are the sons of the living God, remember this, and this brings me to my third point, God will greatly reward the righteous. Jesus concludes this parable in contrast to the wicked, a glorious future for the righteous. He declares that the wheat will be gathered into the barn at the great harvest, he explains later that the great harvest is the end of the age. He then quotes from Daniel 12:3, Then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their father. The significance of what Jesus says here is mind-boggling, and the more I studied it in preparation for the sermon, the more awestruck I became. In order to understand the significance of what Jesus quotes, you must understand the context of when it was first uttered. We're jumping around a lot here in our verses, but if you can, put your finger there in Revelation uh, chapter 20, and let's turn to Daniel chapter 10. So while Daniel was in Babylonian captivity, he was fasting for several weeks and standing along the banks of the Tigris River, the same Tigris that runs through Baghdad today. While standing there by himself, he lifted his eyes and saw a man dressed in linen standing on the opposite bank. 
So let me read for you the first few verses of the interaction with this man. In those days, I, Daniel, was mourning for three weeks. I ate no delicacies, no meat or wine entered my mouth, nor did I anoint myself at all. For the full three weeks, on the 24th day of the first month, as I was standing on the bank of the great river, that is the Tigris, I lifted up my eyes and looked. And behold, a man clothed in linen with a belt of gold from Uphaz around his waist, his body was like beryl, his face like the appearance of lightning, his eyes like flaming torches, his arms and legs like the gleam of burnished bronze, and the sound of his words like the sound of a multitude. It's a pretty amazing description of this man. As you keep reading through this passage, you notice that this mysterious man is no other than Jesus himself. In theological terms, you'd call this a Christophany. In other words, Jesus is the one speaking with Daniel 530 years before Jesus' incarnation on the earth, on the shores of the Tigris, about the many things that must happen before the end of the age is complete. By the time we get to Daniel chapter 12, Jesus is speaking about what transpires at the end of the age. We see our familiar passage from the parable of the wheat and the tares. So if you can just flip forward a few chapters to chapter 12 of Daniel, starting with verse 1. Now at that time, Michael, the great prince who stands guard over the sons of your people, will arise. And there will be a time of distress such as never occurred since there was a nation until that time. And at that time, your people, everyone who is found written in the book, will be rescued. Many of those who sleep in the dust of the ground will awake, these to everlasting life, but others to disgrace and everlasting contempt. And here's our familiar verse. Those who have insight will shine brightly like the brightness of the expanse of heaven, and those who lead many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. But as for you, Daniel, conceal these words and seal up the book until the end of time. Many will go back and forth, and knowledge will increase. So in the parable of the wheat and the tares, when Jesus quotes from Daniel, he's quoting from the mysterious man who is speaking to Daniel. This mysterious man was a pre-incarnate Christ, Jesus is therefore, in, de in the parable of the terrors, quoting from himself. No wonder the crowds were astonished at his teaching. But let's not get so caught up in the glorious way that Jesus speaks divine truth, but on what divine truth he reveals. That divine and glorious truth is this. Believers are destined for a very glorious future. The first thing we can expect to see, and I believe this day is fast approaching, is the return of Christ where we will meet him in the air. We call this the rapture. Paul describes the rapture in his first letter to the Thessalonians. He says, For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air and so shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. This is the day that we're all looking forward to. As we see this world wasting away, we more and more long for Christ to return. But before that happens, we still have a lot of work to do. There's two ways that we can approach the end of a harvest. One way is to clock out early while there's still much work to be done. The right way, though, is that with so much work ahead of us and the day drawing near, we must work even harder than ever in the short time we have left, and God will reward us for that. The topic of Christ's return and what we can expect to see in anticipation of that event are on the minds of many believers today. I personally do think we are living in the end times, but that is not because of what is happening in America. The events that will precede the coming of Christ seem to be not so American-centric. It's far better to observe world events in relation to, to, in relation to the world events throughout all history in order to get a more accurate view of where we are. There are certainly some unique things that have happened in the world within the past hundred years that seem to indicate that we're in the final days. I won't go into all those this morning, but maybe after we get back into discipleship hour times, I'll be able to continue my class in eschatology and uh, we can go into those things a little bit deeper. 
So immediately after the rapture, there's going to be a great time of tribulation on the earth for seven years. The tribulation at that time far exceeds any type of tribulation we see today or anything that has ever been witnessed throughout all of history. Believers will not suffer through this, but the events that unfold in the book of Revelation clearly show us that we won't be ignorant of them. We will see it all, of, all unfold in awesome wonder as we worship our Lord and Savior. When the tribulation is over, we will return with Christ to earth to reign with him for a thousand years while Satan is bound. In Revelation 20, verse 4, we see that the saints will sit on thrones and will judge the word. If you have your finger still stuck there in uh, Revelation 20, you can flip back to that. Revelation 24 says, Then I saw thrones, and they sat on them, and judgment was given to them. The judicial powers of the saints are described in other places of Scripture. In Matthew 19, 28, Jesus said to them, Truly I say to you, in the new world, when the Son of Man will sit on his glorious throne, you who have followed me will also sit on twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. In Daniel 7.22, he says, Until the Ancient of Days came, and judgment was given for the saints of the Most High, and the time came when the saints possessed the kingdom. Paul, in 1 Corinthians 6.2, says, Or do you not know that the saints will judge the world? And if the world is to be judged by you, are you incompetent to try trivial cases? Do you not know that, you are to, that we are to judge angels? How much more, then, matters pertaining to this life? So this future time of judgment, we can anticipate that by thinking of this time here on earth as kind of a bar exam for our future judicial powers. When those thousand years have come to an end, there will be a resurrection of the dead and the great white throne judgment. All will be judged during that time. Those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life will be declared righteous because of the finished work of Christ on the cross. The wicked will be judged and thrown into the lake of fire along with Satan and his demons as we had a glimpse into earlier in the sermon. Finally, a new heaven and new earth will be revealed, and we will enter into eternity with God's family. Much more can be said about this blessed time. You can read about it more in Revelation 21 and 22. It's the destiny of all regenerated believers. What a comfort to know that God knows completely what we're seeing in the world today. What a comfort to know that he will right all wrongs, not only that, but he will give the righteous far greater rewards than anything we can imagine. What a great hope we have to one day sit side by side at the marriage supper of the Lamb and enjoy eternity with our Savior that we long to see. This marriage supper of the Lamb is also described in Revelation 19 and is very fitting to look at since today we'll be observing communion. As we're preparing for that, I'd like to read to you from the first several verses of Revelation 19, what this marriage supper of the Lamb will be like. As you're turning to that passage, I'd like to briefly remind you of Jesus' words during the Last Supper. On the night Jesus was betrayed, he and his disciples were celebrating the Passover, a symbolic night that represented God's provision for his people from death. If they are faithful to spread the blood of a pure, spotless lamb over their doorposts, probably sounds familiar. During that meal, Jesus took the cup and declared that he would not drink from it again until the day he drinks from it with us in his Father's kingdom. In Revelation 19, that day that he refers to in his Father's kingdom is revealed to John in a vision. Starting in verse 1, let me read that. After these things, I heard something like a loud voice of a great multitude in heaven saying, Hallelujah! Hallelujah! Salvation and glory and power belong to our God because his judgments are true and righteous. For he has judged the great harlot who is corrupting the earth with her immorality, and he has avenged the blood of his bondservants on her. And a second time they said, Hallelujah! Her smoke rises up forever and ever. And the 24 elders and the four living creatures fell down and worshiped God who sits on the throne, saying, Amen! Hallelujah! And a voice came down from heaven saying, Give praise to our God, all you his bondservants, you who fear him, the small and the great. Then I heard something like the voice of a great multitude and like the sound of many waters and like the sound of mighty peals of thunder saying, Hallelujah, 
for the Lord our God, the Almighty, reigns. Let us rejoice and be glad and give glory to him, for the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his bride has, has made herself ready. It was given to her to clothe herself in fine linen, bright and clean, for the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. Then he said to me, Write, Blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, These are the true words of God. What an amazing time that will be. As we remember Christ's death to secure our future place at this great marriage supper of the Lamb, I'd ask that you please get out your communion cups and peel out the first layer of the bread portion. Turning to Matthew, chapter 26, Matthew's account of that Last Supper. Jesus, during that, that Passover night, the night that he'd be betrayed, it says in verse 26, while they're eating, Jesus took some of the bread, and after a blessing, he broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, take, eat, this is my body. Please partake of the bread. other lid to the cup and remove that. The passage continues. And, we had, and when he had taken a cup and given thanks, he gave it to them saying, drink from it, all of you. For this is the blood of my covenant, which is poured out for the forgiveness of sins. But I say to you, I will not drink of this fruit of the vine from now until that day when I drink it with you in my Father's kingdom. We see a glimpse of that in Daniel's vision in, in Revelation 19. Let's please partake of the cup. Continuing on, after singing a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. As I close in prayer this morning, I invite the worship team to come up for one last song before we conclude the service and go out into our communities to declare the gospel of the kingdom of God and pray in preparation for Christ's imminent return. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your gospel of the kingdom of God. We thank you that not only is it a reality, but it's a revealed reality. We're not left in the dark. You speak many times in scripture from the prophets and even from yourself about what the kingdom of God is like now and what it will be in the future. Lord, and we rejoice in this great future as believers that we have. Um, words cannot express just the great joy that we'll have on that day at the marriage supper of the Lamb. And Lord, we also look at the dim reality of those who are currently rejecting you, Lord, and as we think of that, Lord, we understand that this world needs to know you, and there's a lot of work left to be done. Lord, I pray that this passage will just give us even greater motivation for evangelism, Lord, and we can um, be faithful in, in response to your return. And we pray that you'll come soon. In Jesus' name, amen. Do you stand, please?
for coming this morning, and uh, feel free to stick around. We'll keep the doors open, and if there's, um, if I can pray with any of you, or if any of the elders can be of assistance, please reach out to us. Have a blessed week.